If you're currently writing your own children's book, then this video is a must. After having provided hundreds of one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions on inspiring authors' children's books, I've learned that there are a number of common mistakes that come up over and over again. So in this video, I'm going to share 11 tiny tweaks that we can make right now that will help us elevate our already wonderful children's story to make it an even better one. Hi there, I'm Evie, an award-winning children's author and ghostwriter over on eviejones.com and the creator of Children's Book University. I create videos specifically for children's authors, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my weekly videos. I have a separate video on the five biggest overall mistakes aspiring children's authors are making and how to prevent and fix them, so I'll add the link to the description below. But this video right here is specifically about the actual writing part of our story. So if I were to give you individual customized feedback on your story during my popular one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions, that's what I would look at. My sessions are really popular, which is why I always seem to be booked out months in advance, so hopefully this video will help you regardless of my schedule. Now, when it comes to the writing of our story, I usually talk about the importance of us being clear on two things. One, we want to be super clear on the age range we want to write our story for. And two, we will want to use that age range to determine how long our story should be. The age range and length of our story is something I have covered in separate videos, so I will make sure to add them to the description below. So that's something I won't be covering in this video. Just know that being clear on what age we want to write our story for is really important and should be one of the first steps we are taking. But for this video, let's look at the actual content of our story and go over the 11 most common mistakes I've seen over and over again after having given hundreds of feedback sessions to help you tweak your very own story. Number one, remember whom you're writing for. When writing our story, we will want to always remember who it is we are writing this book for, especially for first-time children's authors. This is a bit tricky at times because as grown-ups, we are used to think like grown-ups, right? And so we are used to write like grown-ups. And that's why we often forget to write for or towards our target audience and instead sound like we are talking to other grown-ups. And so something that always helps me with this is to look at my story through the lens of a child and to ask myself this, how would kids say or express these things? So here are a couple of examples. Adults would say, he approached his friend and inquired about XYZ. The kid's version of that would be, he went up to his friend and asked XYZ. Adults, we got off the bus and entered the building through the front door. The kid's version, we jumped off the bus and ran into the building. Adult's version, I was unaware that this was not allowed. Kid's version, I had no idea that I wasn't allowed to do that. So in general, the way kids say things is just a lot less formal and a lot more relaxed. So always try to remember to consider how kids might say certain things by looking at things from a child's perspective. Number two, consider using dialogue. Instead of telling us what your book's characters are saying or thinking, consider letting them do the actual talking, whether that's in the form of a monologue, dialogue, or thoughts. Because using dialogue gives us an opportunity to weave in the language kids are using. And this in turn makes the story a lot more dynamic and also allows the reader to really get to know a character. So here's a great example. The original text reads, I told my best friend Kyle about the conversation I just had. The suggested text with the dialogue would read something like this. You won't believe what just happened, I blurted out as soon as I saw my best friend Kyle. Both texts express the same or something similar, right? But the suggested text that contains actual dialogue is a lot more dynamic. And the reason it feels more dynamic is A, because we are using language that kids would be using when they are talking to each other. And B, because we are using action words that help us convey how the one that does the talking is feeling that very moment. And that really helps us draw the reader in a lot more. And that leads to my next point on how we can make our story even better. Number three, changing up the intro of our dialogue. Now, what do I mean by that? Whenever we have someone say something in our story, we will have to lead up to it, right? Before I can write what a character is saying, I first have to prepare my readers by letting them know that my character is about to say something. And the most common way to do that is by preceding whatever is being said with something like this. Sarah said, this looks great. Or Grandpa said, 
it's really cold. Or we add the said part after what has been said. This looks great, Sarah said. It's really cold, Grandpa said. Now, what often happens, more often than not, especially for new authors, is that they use the same action word over and over again, meaning the only way they ever introduce whatever is being said is by using the word said. And because this truly happens so often, I actually sat down and created what I call my proprietary Evie's Weeding Dialogue method a few years ago that provides us authors with different ways of leading up to whatever is being said. So let's say Peter is about to say something. And instead of simply saying Peter said over and over again, here are some great alternatives. Peter asked, Peter whispered, Peter responded, Peter replied, Peter shared, Peter laughed, and so many more. And so using different action words here is great because besides changing up our language, we're also letting our readers know how our character might be saying whatever they are saying. By using situation specific words, we can share how the character might be feeling. And to take that even further, my proprietary weaving dialogue method adds words that help describe the action words even more by making use of adverbs. And so we can say, Peter said quietly, or Peter asked quickly, or Peter whispered softly. And so by using my weaving dialogue method, we have so many new and fresh options that can really help us make our story even more dynamic and colorful. And looking at my table right here, we can really create our own options by mixing and matching the second column with the third column. Number four, changing up the way we start sentences. Unless we're doing so for emphasis, we will want to make sure that our sentences vary in how they begin. Especially with consecutive sentences, we will want to see different beginnings. That's something that happens all the time and that I have to point out all the time as well. But it's such an easy and quick fix and it's something we can really train our brain to recognize. For example, in my weekly Sunday email where I share additional tips regarding children's books, I always make sure consecutive sentences don't begin with the same word. So let's look at an example and two tweaks we can use to make the beginnings of our sentences vary a bit. So here is the example. Wendy went into the house Wendy opened the box with a pair of scissors. So right now, these consecutive sentences begin with the same word, which is Wendy. To change it up a bit, here's option number one, replacing the name with a pronoun. Wendy went into the house. She opened the box with a pair of scissors. Again, this is such a quick and easy fix, but the thing is that we can only fix it if we are aware of this and if we pay attention to this. And the option number two we can use to fix it is to change the order or sentence structure. Wendy went into the house. Using a pair of scissors, she opened the box. So here we simply change the order of that second sentence by moving the second part of it to the front. The main ninja tip I can give here is to simply pay attention to and be aware of the beginnings of our sentences. Try changing it up if you have two consecutive sentences that start the same way and most definitely change it up if you have three consecutive sentences that begin the same way. So my challenge for this particular tweak would be to go back to your story and intentionally look for consecutive sentences that start the same way. Even if you believe you don't have any, just give it a go. Number five, using more colorful language. When it comes to writing children's books, the more colorful our language and description, the better. So for example, instead of simply saying, Mary held a bag of candy, for example, we could go all out and actually list what type of candies are in Mary's bag. So here we could say something like this, Mary held a bag that was filled with the most delicious candy, caramel filled candy pops, sweet lemon drops, rainbow colored lollipops, and chocolate covered marshmallows. Describing Mary's candy this way makes this a lot more interesting and engaging, really getting our little reader's mind going. And you can add color like this to any type of situation. Maybe you want to share that a truck is driving down the road. So we could ask ourselves, how is this truck driving down the road? We can even consider our different senses. What do we hear? What do we feel? What do we smell? If it adds depth and color to our story, Perhaps we could say something like this. So here's the original sentence, the truck drove down the road. And now the more colorful sentence, the heavy truck's engine roared as it bumped down the road. 
Number six, using the same tense throughout our story. Now, this one is a big one and something that happens all the time, especially if we have never written a book before. So we really want to pay attention to this one. Once we have decided what tense we want to write our story in, we have to make sure to stick to that tense throughout the entire story. Now, there are all sorts of different opinions out there, but if you know me and have watched any of my previous videos, you know that I always say that there is no one way of doing things. So if you decide that your story is told best using the past tense, then don't let others tell you otherwise. The same holds true if you decide that using the present tense will be best for your story. The thing that is important when it comes to the telling of our story is that we are consistent and that we're using the same tense throughout. So my number one recommendation and ninja tip here is that once you have completed your story, go and read it in its entirety from front to back, focusing only on the tense you've used. Reading with a specific purpose in mind really helps with the finding of tiny mistakes like this that are hiding in our text. Now, one area that is often confusing to aspiring authors is when we have dialogue in the story. So the big exception to our consistency rule is this. While our story may be told in the past tense, the dialogue itself usually is in the present tense. So an example would look like this. Julie couldn't believe her luck. Looking at her friend, she said, I can't believe this is happening. So while our story is told in the past tense, the dialogue part itself is in the present tense. Number seven, writing in rhyme. Now this is a big one and near and dear to my heart because writing in rhyme is my absolute favorite way of writing. Now the word count of children's books is already extremely low when compared to any other genre. And when writing in rhyme, this already low word count usually gets lower still. And so what that means is that every single word that goes into our rhyming story has to be just right because every single word counts. I would say about 35% of my one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions are for rhyming stories. And so the five main ninja tips I always share are those right here. One, when writing in rhyme, we will want to pay attention to the rhythm of our rhymes. Now, just a quick warning, when it comes to poetry, there are different ways to describe different aspects like rhythm, cadence, or meter, for example. But I'm not going to deep dive here. All I'm going to say here is that when it comes to writing our rhymes, we will want to make sure it flows nicely and easily so that when the reader reads our story, it doesn't feel bumpy, but very smooth. I'm sure we all read bumpy rhymes before where it just doesn't flow. So we will want to make sure our story won't be one of them. So without getting technical at all, something that always helps me personally is to write my rhyming parts or sentences underneath each other. And if they are about the same length, then they usually flow well because being the same length usually also means that they have the same or close to the same number of syllables, which always helps with the rhythm, but you can always simply count the syllables instead. So here are two examples from the beautiful book Giraffes Can't Dance by Giles Andre, where the number in the parentheses indicates the number of syllables on that line. Gerald swallowed bravely as he walked toward the floor, but the lions saw him coming and they soon began to roar. So they have 13 and 14 syllables while also being about the same length. Here's another example. Then he found a little clearing and he looked up at the sky. The moon can be so beautiful, he whispered with a sigh. And again, we have 15 and 14 and very close. So if your lines are about the same length and have about the same number of syllables, then we usually have a good rhythm going. There are of course exceptions, but that's usually the more general guideline I use when I'm writing simple rhymes. Two. Not every rhyme has to be a true rhyme, like mice, twice, nice, rice, or street, meat, fleet. Near rhymes are a great option as well, like meat, east, or dog, walk. But if possible, we do want to try to keep true rhymes the main type of rhymes. And the number one tool I use for this all the time is rhymezone.com. And the reason I love it is because it has an actual near rhyme option I can select in its drop down menu. 
Three, once we have established a pattern or scheme for our individual verses or stanzas, we will want to try to stick to that pattern. For example, the lines from the book Giraffes Can't Dance, the way they appear in the book follow the simple four line rhyme pattern where the rhyme scheme can be described as A, B, C, B, where lines A and C don't rhyme and the B lines rhyme. Gerald swallowed bravely as he walked toward the floor. But the lions saw him coming and they soon began to roar. So we generally don't want to break that established pattern, but of course there are always exceptions. For example, we may decide to break that pattern if we want to really emphasize a certain point in our story. But when we break that pattern, we should only do so intentionally, not because we didn't realize that we had a pattern to begin with. Four, we should never settle for a rhyme and we shouldn't just use filler words because we can't come up with a better rhyme. So for example, if you have something like this, his favorite month each year was May because the sun was shining. So he said, hey, that's a really silly example, but something I see all the time. I can tell right away when something was simply added to the story because the author had a hard time finding a good rhyme. So what we can do here instead is either one, take a break and get back to that particular part in our story later. Or two, if we really want to keep the same words, we could try changing the order of the words so we have a different word at the end of the line so we can try to find a better rhyme for that new word. Or three, if we don't mind changing the words, we can use a tool like the good old thesaurus and try to find a different word that means the same thing, a synonym, right? And then try finding a rhyming word for the new word. So when writing and rhyme, be patient with yourself in the process. Don't force it and don't settle. And ninja tip number five when it comes to writing and rhyme is to show the reader how to read your rhyme. This is another interesting one that I see so, so often, yet I've never ever seen anyone address this before. As a reader, it's not fun having to figure out how the lines of a story are supposed to be read so they rhyme. And so what we as authors can do is display our lines the way they are meant to be read. So again, let's take an example from Giraffes Can't Dance with these lines right here slightly rearranged. Then one by one each, Animal who'd been there at the dance arrived while Gerald boogied on and watched him quite entranced. Now, if we are not actively paying attention, we might not even notice that this part is meant to rhyme. So a more thoughtful way of arranging these lines would be the way they are properly shown in the book, like this right here. Then one by one each animal who'd been there at the dance arrived while Gerald boogied on and watched him quite entranced. So we want to make sure to break our lines in such a way that lets the reader know where to take a natural pause or break and where we have our rhymes. So they become very clear. So the way we want to display our lines is meant to help the reader read those lines properly. So always plan out how you want your lines to appear in your book and then read your lines out loud and maybe even have other family members or friends read them out loud to make sure your lines truly flow and that they're not bumpy. Now again, this was not meant to be a tutorial on how to write poetry, right? This is purely meant to help us tweak our rhyming story, especially if we've never written in rhyme before. And I say this because there are very many passionate poets that may feel that there is so much more to say about this. So this was truly just a little side note. Number eight on how we can tweak our story, sharing lessons without sounding too preachy. That's something I also shared in my book, How to Self-Publish a Children's Book. When writing our story, we want to make sure that it doesn't come across as too preachy or teachy. Sharing an important value like kindness and patience and being ourselves is really important. And we want to share these values in such a way that it's beautifully woven into our story because kids can often smell a hidden agenda from a mile away. A wonderful example is again, Giraffes Can't Dance, where kids learn through this beautiful story that it's okay to be different and that we shouldn't listen to others when they want to tell us that we can and can't do something. And while little readers will walk away with this shared message, nowhere in the book is it spelled out or stated that way. Instead, it is woven into the story itself and those types of stories are always the best ones. Okay, number nine to help us tweak our story is to begin our story with a hook. 
The way we begin our story can be so powerful and because children's books are usually so short, it's often best to jump right into the story without the setting of the scene. What we essentially want to accomplish with the way we write our beginning is to hook the reader right away. We want them to wonder right away what's next or what happened. So when looking at your story's beginning, try to see if it would intrigue you enough so that you would want to continue reading the story. And to show you what I mean, I wanted to share a couple of beginnings right here. That's the gum right there that you got in your hair. This is from an account of the gum by Adam Rex. There is no mention of where the gum came from or how it was unwrapped or whose gum it was. We may learn this later on in the story, but as for the beginning, we are jumping right in. If you give a moose a muffin. This is from the book If You Give a Moose a Muffin by Laura Namaroff. Here we too jump right into the story. We don't know where we are. We don't know where the moose came from. We don't even know who is doing the muffin giving, right? We jump right in. Slow down, Isabella, the father said. Those books aren't going anywhere. This is from Isabella, star of the story by Jennifer Fosbury. This one is so great as well. Here the reader might instantly wonder what books this dad is talking about and why Isabella is running. So if this first line gets the reader curious and gets the reader wanting to know more, then this line has achieved its goal. That's exactly what we want our first line to do. The number 10 tweak to help us with our story is to create a memorable ending. Now this one is humongously important, so much so that I actually created a separate video on how to create the best ending for our children's book a while back. Because the number one thing we want to achieve with our ending is to make it memorable and fulfilling. So that kids and us grown-ups who are reading books to our little ones will want to read it over and over again. So I will make sure to link to that video in the description below. Just know that just like with the writing and rhyme, you don't want to rush it or force it. You want an ending that is just right. And something that I actually always do when I'm writing my own stories or those of my ghostwriting clients is that I often start the writing process with the end already in mind. That way I have something I can write towards, something that will guide me throughout the entire story. But again, I go into great detail in that separate video, so be sure to watch that as well because just like with a great vacation, if something doesn't feel right about the ending, if something goes wrong at the end of our vacation, even though the actual part of the vacation was amazing, it's usually the end that we still remember the most. So we will want to make sure our ending is really strong. And the last thing we can tweak about our story is number 11, the title. I talk quite often about the importance of having a great title and to use it strategically and be really smart about this. And that's because A, it's the title that will help potential buyers decide whether or not this book is about a topic they were looking for. And B, it's the title that will help us weave in keywords that in turn will help with our book's discoverability. The way we name our book is always very near and dear to our heart, right? So hopefully my perfect title formula videos will help you with the creation of your perfect title. I've added the link to the description below. So whether it's remembering our audience, considering using dialogue, changing up the intro of our dialogue, changing up the way we start our sentences, using more colorful language, making sure we are using the same tense throughout our story, following my five rhyming tips I shared with you, sharing lessons without sounding too preachy or teachy, beginning our story with a hook, ending our story with a truly memorable ending, and creating a strategic title for our magical children's book, I hope that these 11 tweaks will help elevate your beautiful story. In the end, things like the tense you write your story in or the rhyming scheme you choose for your book is entirely up to you. Having read thousands of successful children's books, I've come to realize that there simply is no one single right or wrong way of doing things. It always depends on the story we are telling, but it is my hope that with these shared tips, we can really make a difference because sometimes all it takes is one tiny tweak to make an already wonderful story an even better one. And you now have 11 such tweaks. I cannot wait to see where you will take your story with this. I really hope you found this video helpful. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't yet. It really encourages me to keep making free videos for you just like this one. Here's to the tweaking of your very own beautiful story. Bye! That's the gum right there.
that you got there in your hair. No, that's the gum right there that you got in your hair. Yes. When writing our story, we want to make sure that it doesn't come across as too peachy or teachy. Pre peachy. Preachy. <laughs>